Hi, my name's John Trimble. I'm one of the tech leads here at Datastax, and I have a fun demo to share with you all. Today we're going to be using machine learning and vector search to enable us to search for images that are in a similar style. So what I want to be able to do is take an image of a piece of artwork, say Vincent van Gogh's Starry Night, and search for all the artwork that shares a common style with it. So what do I mean by style? Well, style can be defined in a number of ways. It can be based on the uh, artistic movement, say uh, uh, Impressionism versus Cubism. It can be based on the time period, such as Gothic versus Renaissance art, or the medium, uh, a photograph versus a sketch. For our purposes, we're going to define style as just being the manner in which the content of an image is expressed. So if you have a photo of Notre Dame and a sketch of Notre Dame, both those images have the same content, but they have a different style. So if we're going to search for images based on their style, we're going to need, need embeddings that encode style information. And to get those, we're going to use the venerable VGG19 model. Now, this is an older model. It comes from around 2014, uh, but it's still quite effective. I chose to use it because a number of the papers uh, I referenced on style transfer while making this demo uh, use this particular model. And the way it works in its normal operation is you feed images here to the input and at the output you get the category of the image. Right? It's a cat, it's a chair, it's a duck, it's a house, it's a whatever. Uh, now we're not particularly interested in the categories of images. What we're interested with this model in is the outputs of the intermediate layers the feature maps produced by the convolutional layers. That's these yellow blocks in the diagram here. So what is a feature map? Well, a feature map in this, in this context is a two-dimensional array of values that represent some feature with respect to the image that the model has learned to, to detect. Now, every image, Starry Night, for example, effectively starts its life out with three feature maps. One feature map for each of its color channels, red, green, and blue. Here are those feature maps for Starry Night. Now, we then take these feature maps and we feed them as input to the first convolutional layer of VGG19 and we get 64 feature maps as output. And then those feature maps are passed to the next layer, convolutional layer of VGG19, and we get 64 more feature maps. And this continues throughout the network. And as we get deeper into the network, the feature maps become smaller and also more numerous. So here's a, a set of 256 feature maps produced by a later layer in the model. Now the feature maps produced early on tend to represent low-level information about the image, things like edges and colors. Uh, and you can actually almost make out the original image in some of these feature maps from early on in the network. Now, as we progress through the network, we get increasingly semantic features. Uh, we get feature maps that uh, uh, represent textures um, and shapes and so forth. Um, and then eventually we can get uh, feature maps that start detecting uh, uh, 
highly semantic information, like this is a tree-like thing, or this is a cat-like thing. Now, while the values of the feature maps tell us something about the content of the image, uh, surprisingly, the statistics of the feature maps could tell us something about the image's style. Even statistics as simple as the mean and standard deviation of each of the feature maps. So my thought is, why don't we take some subset of the feature maps produced by VGG19, uh, compute their mean and standard deviation, and create a vector out of that that we can use as our style embedding. So let's do it. Now, you can use v VGD19 comes right out of the box with PyTorch. Uh, here I'm just wrapping it. I'm not really doing anything particularly sophisticated here. I just need to collect the intermediate feature map outputs so that I can use them later. So here in this forward function, I'm going to pass in an image. Um, run that image through VGG19, get the feature map outputs, and then create a dictionary that maps convolutional layer names to the feature maps they produce, and I'm going to return that. Here is the subset of convolutional layers I'm going to use the feature maps of. Uh, to construct uh, these embeddings. And here's the function that builds the embedding. It takes uh, that dictionary that maps convolutional layer names to feature map values for each, for each of the uh, uh, layers. It uh, gets the feature maps and computes their mean and standard deviation and then puts them into a big old vector and returns it. So now we have style embeddings. Now to persuade you all that uh, these embeddings really do encode style information, we're going to do a, a small style transfer uh, example. Now style transfer is the task of taking the style of one image and applying it to another image without changing its content. So here what we're going to do is we're going to take the style of Starry Night and apply it to this photo of the Golden Gate Bridge. Now, in order to do this, we're going to need a representation of not just style, but also content for our content image. Um, and to do that, we can just pick one of the later convolutional layers in the model, take the feature maps for that convolutional layer, and just turn them into a giant vector, uh, which is what we do here. Um, we get that dictionary. Uh, that maps convolutional layer names to feature map outputs. We grab one of the later uh, convolutional layers out of that map, and we turn it into a large vector. Now, in this case, for the content vector, we're not computing the mean and standard deviation. We're just returning uh, the feature map values as they are, but as a vector. And then what we're going to do is we're going to compute the content vector of the content image, the style vector of the style image, and then we're going to generate an image such that it's such that the generated image's style vector maps this, matches the style vector of the style image, and the generated image's content vector matches the content vector of the content image.
Here we're uh, initializing target image, which is the image we're going to generate. Um, we're initializing it to be the same as the content image, but you could initialize it to random noise or the, 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 the content image plus some random noise if, if you chose to. This is computing the style vector of the style image and the content vector of the content image. Here we're setting, we're going to do style transfer in um, a bit of an older way with bat propagation. There are much faster and, and, and uh, uh, better ways to do style transfer these days, which you can find online. Uh, this is just a, a pretty basic example, just to illustrate the style information is here. Um, and when we're doing back propagation, we just want to change the values in the image we're generating in order to minimize our loss. So here we're uh, setting up our optimizer, uh, but telling it it's only supposed to update uh, the values of our image. Okay, uh, and then this is pretty straightforward. Um, we uh, get the features of our target image. We get our target image's content vector. We get our target image's style vector. We compute a loss between the target image's style vector and the style vector of the style image. We compute another loss based on the, the difference between the, the target image's content vector and the content image's content vector. And then we back propagate uh, based on the loss, which will modify our target image. And then we do that repeatedly for a period of time. And at the end of it, we get this. This here is a, a picture of the Golden Gate Bridge, but with elements of the style transferred over from Starry Night. We can see that the colors of the image look like those of Starry Night, and we can see the swirl patterns in the sky and in the water that are similar to those found in Starry Night. Uh, but we still see the same content, right? This is still the Golden Gate Bridge here. Okay. So hopefully I've convinced you all that the style information is in these embeddings. So now we can do a search, and for that we're going to need a data set. And to start with, I got this uh, uh, best artworks of all time data set I found on Kaggle.com. Now, I'm not an art critic. Uh, I'm not judging the art. I don't know if this is really the best artwork of all time. It's just the, the name of the data set. Um, it contains about 9,000 images from 50 different artists. It says 51 artists here because one of them had a most unfortunate incident with a Unicode character and got counted twice. Now we're not quite yet ready to be shoving stuff into the database uh, because we're still kind of playing around to see uh, uh, if this is going to work. Um, so I went ahead and made this vector store class. Okay, this is the worst implementation of vector search, a vector search, uh, but it'll do for now. Uh, you just put a bunch of vectors in it, and then when you want to find the nearest neighbor of some query vector, it just does a brute force search to find the nearest neighbors. Uh, it's real slow, <laughs> but it'll do. Um, and then we populate that vector store uh, with all the images from our data set using that extract style vector uh, function from earlier to create our embeddings. Oh, and this is just some code for loading an image and searching the vector store. And this, this code here isn't very interesting. It's for displaying the image results we get. Um, okay, so now ready to do a search. So we're patching, passing the search and display function, our vector store, uh, a path to an image, 
It's going to be that same starry night image. And the uh, uh, function to use to extract an embedding from our query image. And this is what we get back. So here's our query image. And here's our top search result. <laughs> starry night. Starry night is in the style of itself. That's good news. And then we get uh, another Van Gogh painting. Uh, and we should expect that. Uh, Vincent Van Gogh has a pretty distinctive style. <laughs> I said uh, uh, Vincent Van Gogh has a pretty distinctive style. But then who's this French dude? Uh, Toulouse-Lautrec? Well, it, it turns out that Toulouse-Lautrec knew Vincent Van Gogh. He even painted a, a portrait of him. And uh, the two of them have been noted for having some similarities in their style. Uh, so it's not surprising to see him in uh, these search results. And then we get a Van Gogh, and a Van Gogh, and a Van Gogh, and a Van Gogh, and a Van Gogh. Uh, a Picasso that got lost in the Van Gogh exhibit and a Van Gogh. So eight Van Goghs, one Van Gogh doppelganger, and a lost Picasso. Looks like it's working to me. But there's a problem. The embeddings we have are 3,000 dimensions in size, uh, which is a bit on the large side. For reference, ChatGPT embeddings are about 1,500 dimensions, and really even that's kind of big. Um, but why do we care about this? Well, the runtime of vector search uh, is in terms of the, the number of SS tables times the number of vector dimensions times the log of the number of vectors. This means the, the vector search performance is linear with respect to your vector dimensions. So if you can have the size of your embeddings, you can actually double the performance, at, at least on paper. Right. So how do we do that? Um, well, there are a number of ways. You could use principal component analysis, for example. Uh, but I have the PyTorch hammer in my hand, and I'm going to use it. We're going to build an autoencoder. Oh, here, let me get my uh, let me get my face out of the way of the diagram. There we go. So, what is an autoencoder? Well, this particular autoencoder is just a fully connected network. And um, we're going to set it up to have uh, roughly uh, 3,000 dimensions for its input, the same size as our current style embeddings, and uh, roughly 3,000 dimensions uh, for the output. Again, the same size as our current style embeddings. And then we will train it such that when we put a style vector in the input, we'll get that same style vector back in the output. Now, that sounds pretty useless, right? Like, what good is a model that just reproduces its inputs and its outputs? Well, the secret is this bottleneck right here in the middle. Because why the in input and the output will be uh, roughly 3,000 dimensions in size, we're going to make this bottleneck about 500 dimensions in size, so one-sixth the size. And since the only way information can get from the input to the output is through this bottleneck, if we can train this model to successfully reproduce its inputs and its outputs, then all the information needed to reproduce the inputs 
is necessarily available to us at this bottleneck. So after we train the network, we can throw out this decoder portion, these yellow circles, and just use the remainder encoder portion to take our 3,000 dimensional vectors and turn them into 500 dimensional vectors. All right, so let's do it. Let's build this thing. So we're going to say the style vector is 512 dimensions. That's going to be the, the, the reduced size uh, style vector. Here's the code to, to build the network. This is actually pretty straightforward. Uh, this here is the encoder uh, part of the model. And it's just a, a, a couple of linear layers with some Relo activations. Here's the auto encoder. Um, the encoder section is just, an, just from that class above. We instantiate here. And then the decoder portion of this actually looks very similar. It is also just a couple of linear layers with some Relo activations. And then when we uh, uh, invoke this thing, we're going to pass it as input uh, some uh, style embeddings. We'll pass those style embeddings to the encoder. So we're going to get as input the larger style embeddings, the 3,000 dimensional ones. We're going to pass those 3,000 dimensional uh, embeddings to our encoder, which is going to return some 500 dimensional uh, embeddings. And then those embeddings will be passed to our decoder, which will return 3,000 dimensional uh, embeddings again, which we will then return. Now to train this thing, we're actually going to get a, another uh, larger uh, image data set. This one's uh, the WikiArt uh, data set. It comes from some uh, uh, data dump of wikiart.org. There's about 80,000 images in this data set from about 130 different artists. All right, now the trainings. So the training here is pretty straightforward. We iterate over all the elements in our training data. We get the images. Uh, we get the uh, uh, features using the VGG19 uh, model. These features are again that, that dictionary mapping convolutional layer names to feature map values. We extract the style vectors. These are the large style of vectors, the, uh, uh, the 3,000 dimensional ones. We pass that to our autoencoder, which returns to us uh, what we hope are the same uh, embeddings. We then compute a loss to that effect. And then we back propagate to update the weights in our model. And then we do that for some period of time. When we're done training, we save the model. Very important step. And then here we load it again. What we're loading this time is just the encoder portion of the model, uh, which we can use for doing dimensionality reduction. Okay. Now we create a new function to extract uh, a style vector called extract small style vector. It takes the same uh, input of uh, a dictionary of convolutional layer names to feature map values. Uh, it calls the original style vector function with that map to get the large style vector, right, the 3000 dimensional one. It then passes that 3000 dimensional vector to our encoder, which returns a 500 dimensional vector, which we then return. And just like that, we have embeddings of a reduced size, of one-sixth the size, in fact. Um, all right. Then we uh, repopulate uh, a, a new vector store with the images from that 
the greatest artworks of all time data set um, using the uh, small style vector this time to populate it. And then we do our search again. And what we're hoping to find is that we get search results that are basically the same. So here we go. Here's our query image again, starry night, and our top result, starry night. Starry night still in the style of itself, off to a good start. Next result, a Van Gogh, a Van Gogh doppelganger, a Van Gogh, 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 a Van Gogh uh, and a Picasso uh, still lost in the Van Gogh exhibit. So it looks pretty good. We're still getting, you know, eight Van Goghs, a Van Gogh doppelganger, and a lost Picasso. But how do we quantify the results? Right, that result looked pretty good, uh, but but how do we get a, a kind of a robust uh, a metric for determining how good our results are uh, when using this compression. So for that we're going to use recall at k. Uh, now what recall at k gives you is effectively uh, in this case uh, it tells you what percentage of the results you get back when using your compressed embeddings are the same as what you've gotten back had you used the original uncompressed embedding. Okay. So if we get a, a score of 100%, that means we get the same results with our compressed embedding as we would have using the original embeddings. So we would get an optimal uh, uh, result. Um, and whereas 0% means you're, you're basically getting none of the same results at all. Okay. I'm not going to go too much into exact, exactly how this is calculated. Um, so I computed recall at 10. And that's because throughout this demo, I'm really just going to be looking at the top 10 images uh, when doing a search. And what I found was that the uh, recall was 79.6%, so roughly 80%. That means when we do a search with these compressed embeddings, in those top 10 results, on average, eight of them would be the same eight images we would have gotten had we used the full size embedding. So 80%, not too bad. Um, Okay, well, we did that, uh, we did that with uh, style embeddings, but for uh, comparison's sake, we'll go ahead and do it for uh, content vectors as well. Um, for these content vectors, uh, I'm just going to use the output of the penultimate layer, which is just a fancy way of saying the second to last layer. And the penultimate layer in this case is the layer right before the softmax this layer right here. Uh, do, 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 scrolling down, scrolling down. Man, this is a large notebook. All right, top, uh, recall, okay, okay. So we're gonna get these vectors for, uh, for we're gonna get these content vectors as well. And we've got all the same problems we had before. The vectors are too big, so we've got to build an autoencoder to compress them. Um, but we'll go ahead and skip all that. This is really all the same sort of stuff we saw before. Okay. And at long last, we have arrived at uh, the Cassandra vector search portion. So I'm going to start this off with a PSA. So the way I am measuring how similar two vectors are is I'm, I'm looking at the cosine similarity. So I'm looking for, for vectors that have very small angles between them 
to understand how related those vectors are. Now, when you're using Cassandra vector search, it's actually faster to use dot product similarity. Now, the dot product and the cosine are the same so long as your vectors are unit vectors. And, and to see why that is, if we look at how the dot product is defined, the dot product between vectors A and B is equal to the magnitude of vector A times the magnitude of vector B times the cosine of the angle in between them. But if vectors A and B are unit vectors, then their magnitudes are just one, right? In which case, the dot product and the cosine are the same. Now, if the only thing you care about is the angles between your vectors, then there really is no reason why you can't just turn them in to unit vectors and use dot product similarity uh, for, your, for your search. However, let me show you the, the code I have for, for loading data into the database. All right, here we go. You see I have these assertions here. These assertions ensure that the vectors I have really are unit vectors. And that's important because if you're using dot product similarity and uh, your vectors are not unit vectors, they're going to get some very confusing results. Now I, could, I wish I could say that these assertions I have here were original to this function, but sadly they were not. <laughs> I had some very confusing and frustrating results uh, until I realized that what I thought were unit vectors were in fact not and added these checks. And then I got to reload all the data all over again. So save yourself a few hours of frustration and test your code before you load a bunch of data into the database. All right. Now this talk really isn't uh, on uh, best practices when, when making a schema uh, for Cassandra, uh, but I will show you what I did. Uh, I made two tables. One table I'm going to use for the style vectors, and another table I'm going to use for the content vectors. Um, and in these tables, I store some basic information about the images, like the file name, the artist, the artistic movement. And I also store the compressed embedding, the reduced sized embeddings, as well as the original embeddings. And I'll explain why uh, later, uh, uh, why I store both. For the... Uh, uh, style table, I actually index on both the full size embeddings and the reduced size embeddings. Uh, in practice, I would not do that. I would just index on the reduced size embeddings. But for demonstration purposes, I'm going to index on both. And then for the, the uh, content vectors, again, I store both the, the original uh, embeddings and the reduced size ones. Uh, but for the content vectors, I, I just index the uh, reduced size uh, embeddings. Okay, this code to insert the data is really not that interesting. Uh, no one cares. Okay, this here is the query I use to actually do the vector search. You can see I select out uh, uh, the fields from the table. I also get the uh, distance of the uh, embedding to the uh, query vector. This embedding column here is just going to be either the, uh, it's just going to be the name of the embedding I'm searching on. Is it the reduced size embedding or the original embedding? This here is the query vector itself. And this is the limit summary results to get back. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about this later. 
This query DB function really just executes this query. I have another uh, uh, vector store class. This one has the same interface as the previous vector store class. And the real reason I have this is so that we can do some comparisons later on. Um, here's the search DB function. It uh, uh, computes the embedding for your query image, um, searches the vector store for the image, um, and uh, formats and returns the results. All right. If the uh, demo gods are feeling merciful, this should be running now. And here it is. All right. Let's go ahead and do a search. Oh, I should probably describe these options here at the top first. So we have some options. Style is to do a search uh, using the style embeddings, using the reduced size style embeddings. Style full does a search using the uh, full size style embeddings. Style cheat I will uh, explain later. Content does a search using the reduced size content embedding and content cheat I will also describe later. All right. So to start out with, let's do, use the full size embedding and search for Starry Night. Oh, and here, let me move uh, my face. There we go. All right. Okay, Starry Night, still in the style of itself, getting off to a good start. Oh, let me get a self-portrait of Vincent Van Gogh himself. Maybe another Van Gogh, and another Van Gogh. Um, and then we get this. Um, not, I'm not quite sure how these are related in terms of their style. <laughs> Again, not, not positive. Okay. All right, another Van Gogh. And another Van Gogh. All right, again, I'm not totally sure how this one's style is similar. Um, but we have a number of Van Goghs here. All right, let's use the uh, compressed sized embeddings. Okay, good, Starry Night again. That same uh, self-portrait. Another Van Gogh, another Van Gogh. This first set of results is the exact same as the ones we got from the full-size embeddings. Okay. Interesting. All right, another Van Gogh. I'm not quite sure what it's picking up on here. Maybe it's the swirls in the clouds that are causing it to think this, is, this isn't a similar style. Okay, another Van Gogh. Oh, another Van Gogh self-portrait. Okay, this one I can see. The swirls in the picture are similar to those the ones in the sky over here. Okay. All right, so there's a, uh, there's a style search uh, using uh, Starry Night. What happens if we search on the content? Okay. Very good. Uh, Starry Night has its own content. It's good to see. Oh, well, now this is interesting. I did not know that uh, Vincent Van Gogh sketched out his paintings before he painted them. I always thought he just uh, picked up a paintbrush and just sort of winged it. Uh, but I guess he planned it out first. This is very different than, than my work style, where I kind of just dive right in and hope that uh, 85 Jupiter cells later, it'll all come together. 
Um, okay, here's another result based on content. Um, now, keep in mind, this is looking at content and not style, which is why this image here, this sketch showed up when we were doing a search for content, but was absent when we did a search using style. Okay, in this next result, I'm not quite sure why this is showing up here. Maybe it's these circles here, kind of like the stars. Maybe that's why this is getting picked up. All right. Um, well, this one's interesting because we also saw it in the style search. <laughs> okay. Well, um, I will leave it to the audience to decide if these images have anything to do with each other uh, content-wise. Okay. All right. Now, this sketch was interesting for another reason. Originally, while I was working on this demo, this image actually did not get picked up during a search, which is surprising because it's the closest result after Starry Night itself. So why was it getting missed? Well, Cassandra Vector Search is an approximate nearest neighbor search. Um, so we don't always get the optimal result. Um, but there's a kind of a little uh, workaround that can improve results if, uh, if you should need to, which is back here in this query where we do our vector search. You're right here. Originally, I had set the limit to 10 because really I'm only interested in showing the top 10 results. Okay. There's only 10 images here. But it turns out if you set the limit larger than what you need, say 20, then the top 10 results you get back can actually become better results. Right? So it can make sense to make the limit larger than the number of uh, results you need so that the results you, you do need are actually better. So in this case, I had switched uh, my search query to use a limit of 20 instead of 10, but then I only showed the top 10 of those 20. And as a result, this image started getting picked up. All right. Let's, uh, let's take a look at a, another image. All right, now we'll do a full style search. Here's a Bob Ross painting. All right, and let's search. And what do we get back? Yeah, okay. I can see how these are in a similar style. Yeah. I mean, these all look right. Okay. Yeah. I say these results make a lot of sense. Well, I mean, I guess this one's pretty close too. Okay. All right. Let's try using our reduced size embeddings for style. Ugh. <laughs> well, <laughs> that didn't look quite right. Um, so it's not that this image is, is totally unrelated to our query image, right? Like there are similarities here, like the sky and the water and the trees and this, this mountain here in the background. But the style seems, uh, you know, not, not nearly as close as those other images images we were looking at uh, were. Um, like this is, this over here is uh, 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 an oil painting that's, uh, that we're searching with. Uh, but this looks more like, a, I don't know, like, a, like ink 
like an ink painting. Okay, well now this result looks okay. As does this one, like this looks pretty close. Yeah, looking good. Ooh, again, right? It looks a lot like this other uh, result we got that didn't quite fit. And again, there's that mountain and the water, and there are trees, but it just doesn't, it's not nearly as close in style as some of these other images are. Okay, this result looks pretty good. Oh, this one looks okay. Um, all right. And, uh, <laughs> again, a result that doesn't, doesn't quite fit. So, uh, what happened here is, is that we've suffered some consequences from compressing these embeddings. So we've got uh, some less than optimal results as a consequence of that. Um, but there's actually something we can do to improve the results we have. So you'll recall that I don't actually, when I query the database, I actually get the top 20 results back, not just the top 10. Um, I just only display the top 10 of the 20 I get back. Well, what we could do is we can store both the reduced size embedding and the full size embedding in our, in our table. We do a search on the small embedding, which is faster. And then when we get the results back, we can resort it on the client side using the larger embedding. And the hope is that these results that are perhaps not so great will be resorted below our cutoff, below our top 10 cutoff. Uh, and our top 10 results will actually be pretty good and it'll be like those bad results never happened. So that's what this style cheat does. It does a search using the smaller embedding and then resorts using the full size embedding. So let's see uh, what happens when we do that. Ah, that's much better. These look a lot more like the results we got when using the full size embedding. Yeah, much better. All those uh, particularly not, uh, not so great results have disappeared. Okay, awesome. All right, let's do the let's do the the same sort of cheat with the content vectors and see what we get back uh, from this Bob Ross painting. Uh, mountains. That makes sense. This is a content search. The mountains are pretty uh, prominent in our query image, and so they are in one of the images we found. And the next image, also mountains. Uh, notice these are very different stylistically, but they contain both contain mountains, uh, and hence they show up in the results. Uh, more mountains, 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 uh, hills, mountains, mountains, mountains. Okay, I think it's finding mountains, uh, and that makes sense. All right, let's do another one. Let's do this Picasso. See what we get back. Okay. Uh, that makes sense. Like these are these appear to be pretty similar in style. Um, not the same artistic movement, but we do see the same uh, the same sorts of colors, right? Very vibrant colors. Um, same story here. Um, another Picasso, that makes sense. Um, same artistic movement, it's cubism. Okay, very vibrant colors again. 
okay. Well, I actually think those results make sense, even though they're not all from the same artistic movement. Okay. Let's do search with the, with the content vectors. Oh, that's interesting. We have two people uh, in our query image. Well, one person and their uh, mirror image. And then we have two people here uh, in this search result. Um, interesting. I guess it's picking up the eyes in the query image. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have a story that explains this one in the search results. Huh. Okay. All right. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Well, again, uh, I will leave it to the audience uh, to decide if these images have anything in common content-wise uh, or not. Um, and there we go. Uh, that's, uh, that's vector search, uh, on both, uh, style and content using, uh, Cassandra vector search. Um, all right. So let's talk about recall with Cassandra vector search. So Cassandra vector search is, uh, an approximate nearest neighbor search. So how good is it compared to the optimal result? Well, again, we can compute uh, recall. And again, we'll use recall at 10 uh, to determine this. So this is uh, basically the same setup as the uh, uh, previous uh, calculation of uh, recall. But now we're going to take, we're going to do a search on using some number of images. In this case, we're going to use 50 images. And we're going to do 50 searches. And then compare those search results to what the optimal results would have been to calculate uh, the recall. And in this case, for recall at 10, and I should say this is using the full size embeddings for style. And we're also not getting any extra results. So the limit in the query has been set to 10 as well. Um, and when we compare that to the optimal results, we get a recall at 10 of 100%. Now, I happen to know that 100% is not quite right. <laughs> because we're working on this demo, I had uh, a couple of results that were not quite optimal. Um, I think part of the reason we're getting this result is because I'm only using uh, 50 uh, different uh, query images when testing uh, to compute the recall. Um, and the reason I'm only using 50 is because I'm, I'm comparing it against that, uh, that uh, 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 previous vector store implementation from the beginning of the demo that gives you exact results, but it's incredibly slow, right? I don't want to do more than 50 uh, uh, image queries with that because it'll take forever if I do more. Um, so realistically, the recall at 10 is probably not 100%, uh, but it is very good and very close to optimal, uh, at least in this particular uh, setup with these particular sorts of embeddings. Okay. What about recall using our compressed embeddings? So these are using our, our reduced sized embeddings for style. Um, we're doing uh, a search using Cassandra vector search uh, with a limit set at 10 as well. So we're not getting extra uh, results to, to, to improve uh, uh, our search results. And again, we're comparing that to what the optimal results would be. And we get uh, a recall of about 76%. And then I was interested for this resorting trick where we search using the smaller style embeddings and then we resort the results using the full size embeddings. 
I wanted to know how many extra elements would I need to get in order to get a recall of 95% when compared to the optimal results. Um, and I found that I would need to get 18 uh, elements uh, in total, so eight more than the 10 that I actually uh, needed to get um, in order to get a recall of 95%. All right, well, look at that. 85 Jupiter cells later, and it's all coming together. Um, okay, so you have a few options in this setup for what, what embeddings you use when searching, right? You can use your full-size embeddings, you can use your compressed embeddings, or you can use a combination of the two. Um, and when deciding which one you know would work best in in your case uh, it helps to keep in mind what the runtime performance of vector search is which is the number of SS tables times uh, the vector dimensions times the log of the number of vectors so again linear in terms of your vector dimensions so if you search using the full size embeddings you get the best recall but it's the slowest, and interestingly, it also takes the most storage. Now, why would it take the most storage to store only the full-size embedding? I mean, you would think that if you stored both the full-size embedding plus the smaller size embedding, that that would be the case that it would take the most space, right? Well, it turns out uh, with Cassandra Vector Search, Whichever embedding you index has to be stored twice. So that's the reason it takes the most space to have just the large embedding. Okay. So we can store only the compressed embedding. Uh, that's the fastest and takes the least storage. Um, the downside there is it's also got the worst recall. As we saw with the uh, Bob Ross painting uh, search results. And then of course, our, our next option is storing both of them. Um, we still get a search that's pretty fast, right? Because we can use those smaller size embeddings. Um, it's still got lower storage than storing just the large embedding. And we can get good recall if we set that limit high enough. Uh, but there are some cons. It's still slower than using just the compressed embeddings. Um, it takes more storage than using just the compressed embeddings. And now we have to, to pull more data down uh, from the database, right? Because we got to get those extra results to improve the recall. Plus, we have to get the original embeddings somehow. And if the solution to that somehow was to store the original embeddings in the database, you're going to have to get those back with your search results so that you can resort them. So uh, the good news is you have a lot of options here and a lot of flexibility uh, to find the solution that, that works best and you know, whatever your use case happens to be. Um, I would say, though, that the most important thing is to come up with a good metric like recall or whatever metric it makes sense uh, for your use case that you have some way to evaluate uh, your various options. All right, so what did we learn? Well, we learned that I cannot pronounce Vincent Van Gogh's name. Uh, it turns out to seemingly every country has their own domestic mispronunciation of uh, Vincent Van Gogh's name. I have the American mispronunciation. Um, so there you go. Um, uh, we learned, or at least I learned, uh, that Vincent Van Gogh sketched Starry Night before painting it. I had no idea it was, that was the case until it popped up in the search results. Um, here's another thing I didn't know before, uh, that Toulouse-Lautrec uh, knew Vincent Van Gogh and they had similar painting styles. Uh, honestly, I don't even know who Toulouse Lautrec was until I worked on this. 
by using feature map statistics, we can find uh, artwork that's in a similar style with some, with some asterisks. Um, we had some results that were maybe a little less clear how related they were in style. Nonetheless, I think the results were uh, uh, good enough to be interesting at least. Uh, certainly, it was a lot of fun to do. Um, for unit vectors, the dot product and the cosine are the same thing. Uh, but do test your code to make sure you really do have unit vectors. Um, uh, small embeddings take up less space and make searches faster. Uh, Autoencoders can be used to compress embeddings, um, which I think is perhaps the most generally useful thing uh, from this demo. Um, and it could make sense to use both compressed and uh, uncompressed embeddings uh, when using vector search. Uh, if you're interested in, uh, uh, in looking at this notebook, you can find it uh, at uh, this URL. I will endeavor to get uh, that URL into the video description, but failing that, it will uh, at least be here in the video. And these are the papers that I refer to uh, while working on this demo. Um, well, I hope you all found this educational. Uh, certainly, I had a lot of fun uh, working on this demo. Uh, using uh, Cassandra Vector Search is uh, surprisingly straightforward and easy to do. In fact, it was the easiest part of this uh, whole exercise. And uh, there it is.